cyber thieves have infiltrated Australia's most sensitive government departments. There's a great deal of intelligence material that we don't comment on. Industry too has been hit. It's difficult because it's probably a matter of national security. And the likely culprit isn't hard to find. It is standard operating practice for them to break into the network of the counterparty, learn everything that they can, and then use that to improve their own uh, competitive stance. In the cyber age, it seems, spying knows no bounds. Welcome to Four Corners. This is a story not often told in detail because the details are invariably hard to pin down and to prove, partly because national security is involved and partly to avoid embarrassment. But if I said to you that the departments of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Foreign Affairs and Defence had all been breached by cyber spies, with China the chief suspect, you might understand why there is a cone of silence. But that's not all. We believe a serious breach has also occurred at Australia's chief spy agency charged with national security, ASIO. This is an agency that occasionally goes public to warn every other potential target of cyber spying from government departments to big corporations and other sensitive businesses to keep their security tight. Now we know it speaks from experience. In February this year, an American cyber security firm called Mandiant released a report directly implicating China in cyber espionage, hacking into American government and corporate websites. Earlier this month, a US Pentagon report for the first time accused the Chinese government and military of cyber spying. Some might say that's the pot calling the kettle black. Here in Australia, hundreds of cyber incidents against government systems are recorded each year. But when reporter Andrew Fowler began to investigate, he met a wall of secrecy and subterfuge. Here's his report. Two ASIO officers leaving Canberra on a secret mission to break some bad news. What ASIO's discovered will have far-reaching consequences for both Australia and its allies. Such is the sensitivity of the information, it can only be delivered by a face-to-face -face meeting. It seems that Chinese hackers, notorious for waging a virtual cyber war stealing secrets and spying, have hit the bullseye. And even that is secret. The question is how many successful events there have been. Most people who work in this space know of many, uh, but they won't tell you what they are because they can't divulge their sources. It's a secret war where the body count is climbing daily. There's been a, some 50 to 60% increase in intrusions or cyber attacks in the last 12 months. Our big threat is that we're at cyber war or conflict now and it's continuous. There are those who want to fight back. We need to send a clear signal to them that this is unacceptable behavior. This is theft, uh, this is uh, piracy in cyberspace, if you will, and uh, uh, we, as in the Western world, will not stand for it. Adelaide is best known for its wine, food and churches, but it's also a thriving hub of defence industries. And that's where the ASIO officers are heading. It's here one of Australia's great business success stories has been having trouble. Looks can be deceptive. Kodan is a multinational electronics company with offices in the US and the UK. But two years ago, business took a dive. Chief Executive Officer Donald McGurk and his team were baffled. What McGurk couldn't work out was why sales of one of the company's biggest sellers, their mine lab metal detectors, had gone off the boil. He's understandably proud of the product. So the metal detectors are, um, are made to order again, but they've made to specific project requirements. And so you can see here, again, it's a pretty complex product developed and designed by engineers here in Australia. But it seems others overseas liked the Australian design so much they copied it. 
using reverse engineering to make inferior versions that sold at a fraction of the price. To add insult to financial injury, the control boxes of the copies were marked Made in Australia and labelled with a fake MindLab logo. But in fact, they'd been made in China. Kodan was a victim of industrial espionage. It's not until these products uh, came back to the service centres because they weren't operating correctly and, uh, and some of our dealers uh, opened them up and said, something's not right here. These uh, circuits are not the circuits that we've come to expect. There was something else he didn't expect. ASIO arrived on his doorstep to tell him something he was completely unaware of. The company's computer system had been hacked. We've been told that uh, your company has had problems of hackers possibly from China. Can you tell me about it? That's an area that's difficult for me to uh, talk to you about on camera. It's fair to say that in recent times we've taken steps to secure our uh, computer systems by putting in multiple firewalls and you can draw whatever conclusion you would like from that. But we've certainly had to take a much more serious approach to the approach that we had taken some time ago. Kodan had a lot to protect, much more than its metal detectors. One of its best sellers is a portable field radio that can transmit encrypted messages great distances. They've sold thousands of them to the Australian, British and US military. So how secure are they, those radios? These radios usually have frequency hopping and encryption. So again, our government supply export permits for these radios to be exported, so they're done in full consultation, or consultation with our government and... Uh, it's a sensitive so subject. So these are, in fact, um, radios that are used by military as well as intelligence organisations as well? Not as much intelligence organisations. These radios are, are classed as what you would call a Tier 2 type product. So they're used mainly for uh, non-tactical operations like border protection and counter-narcotics control. Right, but you do actually sell a version of that that does do that kind of work? We do. Yeah. Absolutely. The high-tech radios and Kodan's other military products have made the company a target. The ASIO investigation revealed that when a Kodan executive visiting China logged into the Wi-Fi at his hotel, the Chinese struck. They inserted malware onto the work laptop. From there, it infected Kodan's Australian computer system. Intelligence sources believe it was this malware which contained a piece of computer code designed to target files on the Kodan system. This comes back to where the problem is in cybersecurity in Australia. You can protect the crown jewels, but if the case that's surrounding the crown jewels is made of glass, it's a little bit fragile, then you've got a little bit of a problem here. There, but for the grace of God, goes every other defence contractor or, more than likely, there goes every other defence contractor. So if anyone who's looking at what happened to Kodan saying shouldn't have happened to them, um, the reality is it probably has or it will. Do you believe now that the company is secure? Look, I think it's hard to ever believe you're secure. I think um, people that have the will to come and do these kind of attacks on security systems are uh, going to find ways to try and outwit you and find ways to try and get around some of the measures you've put in place. Why is it difficult to explain what's happened to your company? It's difficult because it's probably a matter of national security and it's something that I'm probably not at liberty to discuss on camera. It's estimated computer hackers number in the tens of thousands. Computer giant Apple was under attack from hackers on Tuesday. The hackers say they have the personal financial details. People who use Internet Explorer have been warned of a major cyber attack. While there's been no shortage of media coverage of increasing cyber attacks, few from government or industry are prepared to speak out. 
Gary Waters is a former RAAF Air Commodore, now advising government and industry on cyber security. It's a loathing to actually stand there in public and talk about some of the vulnerabilities we have. Now, it, it, it's sensitive because if you start to identify vulnerabilities, then uh, that sophisticated uh, hackers can get to, then all of a sudden less sophisticated ones can start to find those, those vulnerabilities and weaknesses, if you like. But if you don't we, talk about the vulnerabilities... You can't talk about the solutions. The Australian government and its intelligence agencies are facing off against a new unseen enemy. It's a battle which has largely been fought out behind a veil of secrecy. A secret war which has already cost Australia billions of dollars. Oh, no, this is uh, Canberra. What makes it so unusual in the, in the cyber world? Well, I think it's fair to say that uh some of our, our allies are a bit more open in talking about cyber matters than Australia is. Alastair McGibbon is a government cyber security advisor. He's a rare breed arguing for more transparency, but it's an uphill battle. McGibbon was a senior officer in the Australian Federal Police and established its high-tech crime centre. It would be churlish to deny that there have been probably many other breaches uh, of government agencies, but we don't have a culture in this country of talking about it. Um, Which are, what are the government agencies that have been hit? Well, again, this is the dilemma. Uh, I'm not going to be the first to tell you uh, who they are. But there was someone who was prepared to tell us the targets of these attacks. Our search led us to meetings involving very much the techniques of old world espionage. An intermediary promised we would meet a highly placed insider who had intimate knowledge of sustained major hacks on Australian government agencies. We were given his name and a location where to meet. We gave undertakings to conceal his identity. The journey we were taken on around Canberra was nothing short of extraordinary. Our guide pointed out the government agencies and departments that had been hit. Top of the list, Defence. The department's classified email, the Defence Restricted Network, connects the entire Australian military. A factor of ten times the entire database or the entire amount of information stored within the Defence Restricted Network has been leached out over a number of years. While not top secret, the data network is classified restricted. The amount of data being siphoned out by the hackers was huge. It was emails, basic reports, administrative information. It's once you get together a whole large amount of data, you can start putting together pieces of information. Professor Des Ball is one of the world's leading experts on electronic eavesdropping and cyber security. That sort of activity is basically routine. That's what you have to expect. That's no different than in the old days. Everyone's sucking up every radio message that was transmitted or monitored every satellite uh, uh, email or long-distance telephone call uh, that's going through satellite uh, communication systems. You then have in all of those areas enormous processing and analysis problems to separate the real gems out of uh, the garbage. So why bother? Why bother? Because occasionally it does uh, contain gems. Where was the data going? Multiple locations, other countries. Where do yeah. you suspect? Oh, I'd suspect China. He is not alone in suspecting China. Over the next few weeks, we made contact with a second source, a highly credible person with detailed knowledge of cyber intrusions of government agencies. He explained that the weak link in any security system is always the human factor. Defence has been victim of its own bad practices as much as the efforts of the hacking fraternity to get into their networks. 
According to the source, an officer working in the defense complex in Canberra's Russell Hill sent a highly classified document from his desk computer to his home email account. Hackers had earlier targeted the officer's home computer with what's known as a spear phishing email in the guise of an interesting link. Once clicked, a virus loaded onto the computer. When the Defense Department document was opened, the virus fired a copy back to China. I think the real problem that a nation state like China has is what to do with all the data, not how to get the data. Their attacks, their systems are so well developed and refined that I think the problem that presents to the people like the Chinese is what to do with all the data they've stolen. Four Corners has learned that the breach of the Defence Department only came to light by chance. During an intelligence operation against China, a friendly nation, possibly the United States, discovered information from the classified Australian document in an assessment produced by the Chinese military. According to our source, defence wasn't the only department targeted. A flaw in the security system of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, the coordinator of cyber security policy, allowed hackers to get in the back door. The Department of Tourism portal was not as secure as it should have been. It was being hosted in an area that was linked to Prime Minister and Cabinet. The hackers removed information was removed from PM&C through the insecure Department of Tourism portal. Yet this kind of vulnerability was nothing compared to what happened at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the home of Australia's overseas intelligence agency, ASIS. A highly sensitive document was hacked by a foreign power. Do you know specifically that that has happened? Yes, I do. What was the particular document that you're referring to? Uh, it was a schedule for a specific sensitive project. What was that project? I can't tell you. Yet it was something that was specifically um, a very sensitive project that had a classification which was above confidential. Um, yes, it's a project that would give an adversary a significant advantage when dealing with Australia. And this came from the Department of Foreign Affairs? The documents I've seen that I witnessed were initiated by that department. Do you know who it was that hacked that particular document? It was a foreign intelligence service. From which country? China. Hello, Andrew. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? The government has never admitted to the attacks. We asked the Attorney General, who's responsible for ASIO, Australia's domestic security agency, to explain why. We have specifically been told that DFAT, Defence and PMNC have been hacked, almost certainly by Chinese hackers. Shouldn't that be made public in the public domain? There's a great deal of intelligence material, espionage-related material, that we don't comment on. Uh, that's been the long-standing practice of Australian governments for many decades. Well, why is that? Well, I'm proposing to continue that practice. China is increasingly identified as a major source of cyber hacking. Downtown Shanghai, the country's biggest city, and it's booming. But away from the business and bustle, a nondescript building, home to a secret cyber espionage unit. That unit is part of a larger operation whose goal is to extract trade secrets, intellectual property, other sensitive data from Western uh, companies and organizations and to use that for the benefit of, of Chinese companies and Chinese organizations. Richard Baitlick is a former US intelligence officer. Earlier this year, his company, Mandiant, published a revealing report which for the first time identified the building as one of some 20 centers for cyber attacks against the West. We estimate that there's 
uh, as far as the numbers of people who work there, somewhere in the hundreds, potentially a thousand. The building that we identified is part of a compound, and we know that their expertise is English language speaking companies. His team traced the cyber attacks back to their source. The Mandiant report cited hits on more than 100 mainly US companies, and for the first time, named the attacker. The attacks came from the second bureau of the People's Liberation Army's General Staff Department 3, commonly known by its military unit cover designator as Unit 61398. It's an entirely uh, secretive uh, organisation. Uh, what you can uh, find out about it uh, only comes about because of what mistakes uh, they make. They do all sorts of things. They do the industrial espionage because there's a link there to the uh, private sector, if you can call it the private sector, uh, in China. But they are also uh, well into a whole range of intelligence uh, collection. The Chinese government has repeatedly denied the claims made in the Mandiant report. In a recent interview with the ABC, the Chinese ambassador to Australia said China had also been hit. And China is also a big victim of cyber attacks in the world. And there are um, hundreds of thousands of computers in Chinese um, government agencies which have been attacked by um, cyber attackers from overseas sources. The Mandiant team discovered that the Chinese also had Australian companies in their sites. I believe that there are at least two companies in Australia, um, but in aggregate, so I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of Mandiant's overall picture of the Chinese espionage problem, yeah, Australia definitely has a problem. It is Australian companies supplying mineral resources and building materials for China's boom which are among the chief targets. Three years ago, Four Corners revealed cyber attacks on BHP Billiton, Rio Tinto and the Fortescue Metals Group. Tonight we can disclose the target of a new hit by China's cyber spies, a leader of Australia's domestic and export construction industry, Blue Scope Steel. Blue Scope Steel sells millions of dollars of its products every year in China. It has an office in Beijing and a color bond factory at Suzhou, just 80 kilometers west of Shanghai and unit 61398. Four Corners has been told that three years ago, one of Blue Scope's facilities in China took a direct cyber hit. The hackers were believed to be seeking commercial information and plans possibly including the key to Blue Scope's unique color bond process. Blue Scope disputed this account, but declined to make a public statement to Four Corners on the matter. I deal with companies all the time who often, I don't think, understand how important it is to be protecting really the crown jewels of the way that company operates. And that's obviously everything from your pricing through to your marketing, your mergers and acquisitions, and in, in the case you're talking about, possibly the very processes that are, are used to manufacture a, a, a good or a service. Four Corners understands from a source connected to Blue Scope that information about the hack was relayed to the company by the Australian Federal Police. AFP's Deputy Commissioner Tim Morris took over as head of cybercrime earlier this year. The AFP has a key role in cybercrime and security. I think there's no doubt that we've seen a general increase in the amount of cyber activity, including cyber attacks impacting on Australia. And that includes not just government agencies, but industrial and commercial entities as well. The AFP is part of the National Cyber Security Operations Centre, known as CSOC. This is the home of Australia's new cyber security centre. It's underground, protected by a battery of cameras and sensors. But even here, these kind of protections are largely ineffective against the new cyber threat. 
A few hundred meters west of the CSOC building is the site of the massive new ASIO headquarters. It's been designed to hold nearly 2,000 staff as ASIO has benefited from the post 9-11 spending boom that saw the tripling of its budget. Shrouded by tatty blue fencing, the new building was meant to be in operation in 2012, but there's been a delay and a cost blowout. 630 million so far, and it's still not finished. Four Corners has learned one reason for the delay in ASIO moving into the new building, and it's more than a mere inconvenience. Someone has stolen the blueprints, not just of the overall building, but also of the communications cabling and server locations, of the floor plans and the security systems. It was more than a theft, it reeked of an espionage operation. Someone had mounted a cyber hit on a contractor involved in the site. The plans were traced to a server in China. We put our discovery to Professor Des Ball. That's of major significance. Uh, it's, uh, to me, only uh, one element of the sorts of activities which the Chinese uh, are up to these days. But why but is it particularly significant that they are building plans? Once you get those building plans, you can start constructing your own wiring diagrams, where the linkages are through uh, telephone connections, through Wi-Fi uh, connections, uh, which rooms are likely to be the ones that are used for sensitive uh, conversations, how to surreptitiously put devices into the walls uh, of those rooms or into the roofings above those uh, rooms. Given that those blueprints are now available, and if they are in China, what could the security organisations do here to change the building to make it less vulnerable? At this stage, with construction nearly completed, you have two options. One is to accept it uh, and uh, practice utmost sensitivity even within your own headquarters. The other, which the Americans had to do with uh, their new embassy in, in Washington, uh, their new embassy in Moscow uh, back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, was to rip the whole insides out and to uh, start again. The British had to do that with several buildings uh, in London. We asked the Attorney General to explain how the plans for one of Australia's top intelligence agencies could be stolen. A prime contractor involved in the building plans for the new ASIO building has been hacked and those plans taken. What can you tell me about that? Nothing. I'm not going to comment on operational or intelligence matters. But this and is, I've told you that already in relation to... But this, is a build, um, this is a building, this is not uh, an ongoing operation. This is a, a simple building to house, ASIO, and the plans we understand. I, I'm not, uh, Andrew, I'm not going to comment on individual cases. But why? Uh, I, a, this would be a bit of how long have you got, Andrew, to, uh, for me to explain to you why it is that governments and intelligence agencies don't comment on intelligence and operational matters. But perhaps most obviously, uh, the more that is disclosed about what's known about espionage activity in Australia or uh, operational aspects uh, in counterintelligence, uh, the more that our opponents, people who are engaging in espionage, will know about our capability and know about the methods that we have for detecting espionage or that's at the general level or detecting uh, cyber threats. In fact, I would strongly advocate that legislation be enacted that forces governments to, to tell what has been happening in the networks and forces businesses to also be saying, not just the concept of loss of data, because whenever you start talking about personally identifiable information, you fudge around at the edges and it gives you an out. What we need is rock solid legislation that says, we've had someone who's unauthorised in our system, don't always need to know what they've done, but they've been in there. And that alone would allow us to have a discussion about this. In the geostrategic world, ASIO's problems may seem minor. But any compromise there could impact Australia's relationship with powerful overseas intelligence agencies, 
the giant UK spy base in Cheltenham known as GCHQ, and the US National Security Agency, the NSA, near Washington. Together, they run the biggest electronic intelligence gathering operation in the world. It's here in the murky world of electronic eavesdropping that the tools of cyber attack used to gather intelligence and steal business secrets are crossing over to a new level, the potential for cyber war. Former Deputy Chief of the RAAF John Blackburn is a national security consultant with Research Institute, the Kokoda Foundation. It has started and we have already lost uh, certain phases of that cyber war. It's pretty clear that with the amount of intellectual property theft and uh, data that's been taken out of, of company systems globally, that uh, we've been sort of a bit to sleep whilst the war's already started. What kind of impacts could the worst case scenario have on Australia? In that sort of segment there, if you have large scale IP theft, the value of your companies, the value of your industries will get significantly reduced. Uh, if, you don't, if you can't actually get a return on investment from what you've actually put into a company or its R&D development, if that disappears out the side door, then you've basically lost your value. You start losing that sort of value, the economic impact could be horrendous. Industry has already taken up the weapons of cyber war. We really focus on the tardy attacks, particularly nation-sponsored attacks, identifying them, attributing them, and figuring out what we can do to raise the pain and the cost to the adversaries. We need to send a message that what they're doing today is unacceptable. And I believe today the situation is highly escalatory by us not being able to respond to them. Last year, Dmitry Alperovich, chief technology officer of a US-based cybersecurity company, flew to Australia. He'd been invited by the Defence Signals Directorate to address a closed conference of government intelligence officers. And his message, if you get bitten, bite back. Well, we absolutely need to move beyond passive defence and start implementing offensive strategies to raise the cost and the pain to the adversary. Uh, so far, uh, we've been playing uh, pure defense. We've been uh, sh uh, fielding these attacks. We've been swatting them away. And that ultimately doesn't work. It doesn't work in physical world, and it certainly doesn't work in cyberspace. Andrew Johnston Burt has worked extensively for the British government on intelligence and security. He's been employed by Deloitte, one of the world's biggest business consultants, to bolster client cybersecurity. He's careful with his words about what Australia's security agencies are doing to build a cyber attack capability. We actually know that the agencies are trying to do that. Uh, typically, it's lack of resources and so on. But um, sorry, so they're trying to build an offensive capability. No, they're trying to help um, key private sector organisations that are looking after national assets improve their resilience. Now, you know, inevitably, um, with the... <laughs> they, they have to find their choice of words to explain that. Um, it's really, I can't, I can't describe that. Um, Why can't you? I can't describe offensive cyber t uh, capabilities. But it wouldn't be wrong to believe that a country like Australia would have that capability. It would not be wrong. If we've got the capability, then perhaps we should be suggesting that we do have a capability to essentially bring networks that are attacking us down. And therefore, should you decide to attack our networks, then we would do something to stop that attack. It's too late to stop the first shots in the cyber war. They've already been fired. And in June 2009, an attack on Iran's Natanz nuclear enrichment facility lifted cyber threat to a new level. These exclusive images from Astrium using the French spot satellite show the plant when a virus called Stuxnet hit the nuclear facility's control systems. The Stuxnet virus in its first incarnation uh, was developed to get into uh, Simon's uh, electronic systems, 
which I used in large numbers of applications, but just so happened to be uh, uh, used in the Iranian uh, uranium enrichment uh, uh, program. Not only were those control systems attacked in such a way to render them useless, they were attacked in such a way that the information they were giving off was that they were operating under normal tolerance, within normal tolerances. So it was a very, very, very sophisticated capability. The Stuxnet attack slowed Iran's uranium enrichment operation temporarily. The finger of suspicion pointed to the United States and Israel, who claim Iran is enriching uranium at the plant for nuclear weapons, something Iran denies. Exactly who created the virus may never be known, but there's no doubt about the threat it's unleashed. It's a bit like releasing some type of, you know, something into the environment or, or some type of toxic um, biological weapon. They don't just stop where you want them to stop. You don't draw a line around them. And cyber is one of those classic examples. It didn't take long for Stuxnet to rebound on other countries. China reportedly modified the virus and used it to disable an Indian telecommunications satellite. Stuxnet went into the wild, as in it got accessible by a whole range of other people. And that means any, any idiot on the internet can now use Stuxnet or a Stuxnet derivative to, to carry out their own nefarious activities. The shutting down of the satellite and the attack on the Iranian facility served as a warning that infrastructure is in the front line. Dams and electricity generating plants, anything using computerized systems, are vulnerable to cyber attack. What's happened over time is we're becoming more and more reliant on this cyber domain. It's a, it's a nice buzzword, but it's basically the way everything functions and operates today and more so in the future. For example, the use of smart grids in the electricity networks and wireless connectivity for those it makes a lot of sense financially or economically and it's far more efficient. But have we designed those systems to address the potential threats to them? And in my view, that hasn't been done well. At what point does it become crime, cyber crime, or what point does it become cyber warfare is the biggest issue. And therefore, when you see a cyber incident occurring, the challenge is, is that an espionage activity? Is it a criminal activity? Is it a military warfare type activity? And each of those um, decisions you come to will drive a different sort of response. And my concern really is that it may simply be a traditional spying activity that gets mis misperceived, misconstrued, and that pushes the potential for some sort of reaction much, much quicker and much, much higher. Governments may not have more than a matter of minutes to decide how to respond to a cyber attack. Cyber today is the fifth domain of warfare, uh, in addition to land, air, sea and, and, and um, uh, space. Uh, but at the same time, we should not expect that a conflict will be contained to cyberspace. If you go beyond a Stuxnet and start talking about large-scale denial of service or shutting down of electricity or water grids in nations, then I don't think many nations would really draw too much differentiation between that and a physical or what they call in military terms a kinetic attack, actually, you know, attacking you with fighter planes or ships or something else. One possible reason China is so committed to cyber warfare is it has little alternative. Its military is no match for the West. For China, that's just the problem. And if tensions between Beijing and Washington spill over in the Northwest Pacific, the fear is China has just one shot in the locker. That's your very first step to make those American platforms uh, blind, uh, deaf and, and, and dumb. It's the only way that those relative primitive uh, Chinese capabilities would have any hope against American carrier battle groups. If you're a country like China and you don't go first, uh, then you end second. There's no doubt about that. There is no way that the Chinese can win that unless they take out 
command and control systems unless they can degrade the surveillance capabilities that link the sensors with the aircraft carriers, for example, put false data into those uh, data links, and to ensure that all the information and communication flows to the American Defence Force are so thoroughly degraded that the US cannot use its preponderance in those areas. And is that what you fear, that the Chinese cyber activity is mainly focused on achieving? That's, uh, that's their ultimate objective. There's no doubt about that. Placing constraints on the cyber road to war faces many difficulties. There is no way at all that any international agreement restricting in the slightest cyber operations is, is going to take effect, at least in our region. We have no arms control agreements of any sort in East Asia. The idea that you're going to restrict your cyber operations in, in the event of uh, conflict, no one is interested in taking that, uh, that seriously. Is Building up your cyber warfare capabilities and practising them to the extent that you can do it covertly is what the game is about now. There, there is no uh, consideration whatsoever anywhere in our region uh, being given to limitations on cyber warfare practices. The first step in addressing what appears, in my view, to be an escalating threat is to accept that the threat's actually there and don't just accept that the good work we're already doing is enough. Is it possible to ever have a non-aggression treaty? Oh, I doubt that. But there needs to be, I think, established norms, behaviours and legal frameworks which the majority of countries sign up to, as you do in some of you know, the laws of armed conflict, to say there are accepted norms of behaviour that gives you a reference point. Without that, it's just chaos. If the chances of a cyber peace treaty designed to limit the effects of an attack seem remote, so too do the chances of persuading companies and the government to be more open when they are hit. Yet those who advise Australia's businesses believe it's the only way forward. We don't have mandatory disclosure in this country. One thing the government, we at Deloitte, would encourage is more disclosure. Um, going to mandatory disclosure is another question, but certainly more disclosure is needed. By more disclosure, we can get more information as to what attacks are occurring and why, and with that, we can build greater resilience and greater defence. There are private companies, there's small businesses, and then there's government departments themselves. And if we're going to make a rule for the publicly listed companies, who I believe already have an obligation to disclose to the market those issues, we should apply that same logic across the entire spectrum of government and business. As the drumbeats of cyber war grow louder, time is running out. The US and Chinese presidents will be attending a summit next month and one item on the agenda will be cyber espionage. I wonder how much intelligence they'll bring to the table. A postscript to last week's program on TV sports betting. There's been a lot of political fallout over the course of the week and in the end, we may even see all advertising by betting agencies banned during kids' viewing hours. That's the program for tonight. Next week, we'll take you inside a remarkable police investigation in Britain, targeting gangs of young South Asian men who'd been grooming young girls for sex and gang rape. A hunt that's taken many years. Until then, good night.